Telling L.A. is made possible in part by D.Z. Penner Real Estate, where every home has a story. Let me tell you a little story. I was living in New York when my grandmother died, and she left me her car. Now, if you've ever lived in New York, you know that the, the car is a pretty useless thing to own there. But I'd started feeling really uncomfortable and unhappy with you know, what I saw as the suburbanization of New York. And so I drove it to LA. I can't say I felt exactly at home here, but you know, I did see some weird people and interesting possibilities. So I hedged my bets and I, for the next four years, I was by coastal. And then my New York landlord wrote me that he was going to try to evict me and my transgender rock star roommate, which is another story. <laughs> you have to understand that my New York apartment was so dirt cheap that it was actually cheaper to live in New York City than anywhere else in the country, which is like, you know, completely backwards, right? So it made total sense for me to go back to New York and try to save that apartment. But as I started to replay the last four years, I noticed something. You know, a city is not really a geographic location. A city is its people. What I'd always loved about New York was this sort of chaotic diversity and maverick creative people. But as I kind of scrolled back through the people I'd been meeting those past four years, it dawned on me that most of the people who were like that were the people I'd been meeting in LA. If I wanted to be true, to the New York that I'd always loved so much, I realized that meant I had to stay here. It's easy to tell when you don't belong somewhere, when you don't feel at home, when you don't fit in. But the process of figuring out where you do belong, that's a lot trickier. And when it's a place like Los Angeles, which is so, so many different places in one, that process can really tell us all something about the very idea of home about what home really means. Each week on Telling LA, we explore one theme through the stories of four diverse Angelinos. And this week, it's how I ended up in LA, stories of the search for home, and how we came to understand that this vast mythic city was where we belong. I'm Dudley, and this is Telling LA. Now first, let me get one thing out of the way. Uh, the one story you will not hear tonight is the story of the Hollywood hopeful. But there's a related story um, that doesn't get told so much, and that's what I call the Hollywood adjacent story. You know, what happens when you love someone who has that dream, and where does it take you to help them follow that dream beyond just into the LA city limits? Antonio Sacre knows about that. If someone said to you, here's the deal, you get the man or the woman of your dreams and the odds are 50-50 that it will work out or end in disaster, <laughs> what would you do? Do the odds matter if it's 80-20, um, 90-10, 20-80, <laughs> one in a million, <laughs> what would you do? I followed a girl out to Los Angeles. I was working on a puppet adaptation of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein at a huge Chicago theater on the tiny little studio stage. And she was acting opposite a movie star on the main stage. We met backstage. My puppeteer group rolled in there like a ragtag bunch of robbers, literally stealing toilet paper from the bathroom and food from the green room. And I come down one day in my puppeteer gear. And if you can imagine what that looks like, it's even worse. I have my little cape on, white pancake makeup, goggles perched up on my forehead, metal beak sticking out like this. And I turn the corner and there she was the love of my life, the myth out of all the hundreds of millions of women in the world, there was one match for me, and she was there in a period gown with garlands in her hair and a three-legged dog at her side. <laughs> I stepped back into my puppeteer gown and almost fell over. She literally almost knocked me over. Falling instantly in love like that. If you've never done it, then all of the stories and songs and poems are cliche, but if you have done it, then you are a group of people, one, who has done some really amazing, powerful, and crazy, stupid stuff because of it. 
falling instantly in love. The kids that I teach writing to just down the street in Venice High School, they might describe it like this. Yo, man, it's like you're on this like bridge looking at this water. And you're like, yo, man, that water's chill, but should I stay up here or should I go? And next thing, it's like you're falling. <laughs> like you're falling in the water, you know, and you're like floating, and she's floating, you know, and you're like, yo, what's up, girl? And she's like, yeah, hey, what's up? And it's like, your H. And she's 2-0. <laughs> it's like awesome. It's like God. At least that's what it was like for us. It was like God. We only had two weeks together because she was at the end of her run and we were at the beginning of ours. And she lived in New York City anywhere. And she said that she didn't want a long distance relationship, but she thanked me for showing her that if, if for two short weeks, true love was possible. And those blue eyes filled with tears and she was gone. And should I have followed her? At that point, the answer was no. I was scared. I was told in college by my theater professor when I told him, I'm going to be an actor. I'm going to move to New York City. He said, Antonio, you don't have the talent to make it as an actor in New York City. <laughs> you might be able to make it in Seattle or Minneapolis or Chicago if you're feeling kind of gutsy. I'm feeling gutsy. I moved to Chicago. And Chicago was amazing. I met those puppeteers, who some of them are now my lifelong friends. I discovered a community of people doing amazing work. Trini Rodriguez and her husband. I learned how to do community work in Chicago. I learned that solo performance existed. Storytelling, what is storytelling? You tell stories to people and they pay you? How does that happen? Part of it happened for me in Chicago because I am a bicultural, bilingual son of a Cuban man and an Irish American woman. Or like one of my friends calls me, a leprechano. <laughs> And because I spoke Spanish and knew two cultures, I was speaking to those kids. I was making a difference, and I was making money. Mm -hmm. But I was traveling, and she lived in New York, and sometimes I traveled to New York, and maybe. And sure enough, three months later, I found myself at a gig in New York City. And I found her, and she met me at a diner on 59th and 9th. And right then, with the waiter pouring water in my glass, I say to her, I don't want to date you. I just want to marry you. Those weren't the words that I had planned on the plane ride over. And when I try to put those words back in my mouth, she says, yes, we get engaged right then. And three months later, I pack up my burgeoning storytelling career, and I move to New York City. And it was like, and I wish I were a better writer, a fish in water. New York was amazing for me. It was incredible. I found another community, and storytelling there was great, and I met kids that I was working with, and now my storytelling career blew up. I was able to support both of us on my salary, and she was able to quit her job as a waitress and focus full-time on her acting, and soon she was booking big parts in small TV shows, and small parts in big shows, and small parts in small movies, and soon her agent said, if you want to make the next step in your career, you have to move to Los Angeles. She asked me if I would do it. I had done well in Chicago. I was doing well in New York. I could do LA. How hard can it be? <laughs> now, I was a little nervous, and New York was amazing at the time. I mean, maybe we were there together. Who knows, Dudley? And, um, and I was like, well, and then I heard a story, an ancient myth about a young boy on a horse of power. That horse takes him to places following his heart and his passion, meeting wondrous people in far off places. This is the opportunity. Yes, I leap. Yes, we leap together. We get a U-Haul truck. We get through the desert to Los Angeles, where in the two days we have before the penalty to return the truck, we find an apartment that takes dogs in Silver Lake. We find uh, a car that we can afford, but she wants a better car. I was like, well, what's, why is that? She goes, well, I don't want to be left on the side of the road in an audition, so we buy a VW Turbo Beetle. It's when they just came out. We got it for 2,000 over sticker. My brother's like, good job on the negotiations. And so she's got that brand new car. We've got our little house. Silver Lake was tough back then. Remember that? I don't know if you do. And so there we were, and she books her first job and her second job in LA. Who does that? She gets a better manager, a better agent. It's unbelievable. And now she is auditioning constantly, hearing variations of the same thing over and over again. No, 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 no. And she's learning and adjusting and getting better. The no's are getting easier to take. And no, and no, and finally, yes. Her first major role in a major motion picture that's going to be released, yes. It shoots tomorrow in Vancouver for six weeks, yes. She's gone at six in the morning, bam. And there I am in Silver Lake. 
I plant a garden, hang some curtains, clean up the house. Then I check and I realize that I don't have a whole lot of storytelling gigs on the books coming up. That's a little odd. You know what? I got on the phone. That's how I am. Michael, I started calling. I called up schools. And then I heard variations of this conversation. Uh, yeah, the, I'm a storyteller. Yeah, you, you may have heard of me. I'm a big time storyteller. Yeah. <laughs> I speak Spanish. I hear there's some Spanish speaking people. Oh, you, you repealed bilingual education. You, you don't want to hear Spanish at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can speak English. I, I, I speak English. I was born here. And I, no, 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 I, I, I'm not Mexican, but I, I've been to Mexico. I can, I can tell, I couldn't give away stories in Los Angeles. She'd come back every now and then, back again on another set, gone, pre-Skype. Sometimes I'd be on the set, that was kind of cool. And then I, I start to write. I became a professional writer in Los Angeles because I had nothing else to do. And I was a, not professional, well, a real writer because I was writing pages every day and getting rejected by all the best places. <laughs> and then I said, you know what, I'm gonna do a solo show in sh here in Los Angeles. That can be great. What I didn't realize is that at the time, maybe it's still the same here, I'm not so sure. When you say solo show to someone in Los Angeles, what they hear is, oh, you can't get an agent, a job, <laughs> a manager, or a latte. You're just beating your dead horse of a career in front of your 10 friends. <laughs> and so I didn't know what I was doing, oh no but I'm writing kind of, and then, by accident, I wanted to give away free storytelling, and I finally found one place that would take me, uh, Para Los Niños Elementary School in Skid Row in South Central, and Gates Elementary School in East Los Angeles, and Camp David in Malibu, juvenile detention centers. I had nothing in common with any of those people, except that I was willing to listen and maybe tell a story that might make them laugh, and that was kind of, Kind of cool. She came back. We went to a premiere of one of those movies. We parked our car around the corner because we didn't want to be seen getting out of such a piece of junk car. But I thought we bought a great car. And we get on the red carpet and the flash bulb screaming her name. And she lets go of my hand and I see something ferocious and profound and powerful awaken in her. And I'm so proud of her. I don't need to be by her side. I don't need my picture taken. And she is the best thing in that movie. Sexy and funny. A thing that propels her career another level. Now we're on the list. Party invitations come from all over the city. Her manager tells us which ones to go to, which ones to not go to, and she sends a limo for us because, you know, we don't want to make the wrong impression with the kind of car we're driving. What is up with the cars in Los Angeles? So we get into our first limo to our first big party in our then gritty section of Silver Lake and get out in front of one of those houses in the hills. You've seen them on TV. It was one of those houses. There was a red carpet going up to the front porch. There was a helicopter landing pad next door. There was a woman trapped in an ice cage without any clothes on, desperately trying to get out. I'm like, what is she doing? And like, oh, the sun will melt the ice. I guess she'll be okay. And we go inside, and this dude from that TV show you've known comes up to me. He knows me. How does he know me? He shakes my hand. He's palming a bill in my hand and giving me his jacket. He says, thanks, sport. I said, no problem, champ. I take his jacket. I set inside, and me and my woman go inside to this party, and we end up in a curved living room with a huge floor to ceiling plate glass window. How does it curve like that? With every single light of the city of Los Angeles at our feet, the world literally at our feet. We get married. It is an event I will never forget. I feel like we had gone all in and we both won. We won. And she starts going on set a lot. And now I don't see her. South Africa, two months. Alabama for three, Vancouver for four months, and this is where the story gets a little tricky. She chooses career over us. I was at fault as well. And here I am in Los Angeles. We had to sell our house that we had bought, and the realtor said, you made a bunch of money from this house. If you don't spend it, you're gonna lose every single cent to the government. There's a newly divorced husband thing that takes all your money, and so I bought a house. I guess that law doesn't really exist. I'm in Los Angeles because I chose the wrong woman and the wrong realtor. But it's beautiful, and there's no earthquakes yet. And now, in those places, that school on Skid Row, that school in East LA, that juvenile detention center in Malibu, I know what it means to be broken. 
and the stories get deeper. And they find money for me. And they write grants for me. And they pass my name around. And all of a sudden, I'm the storyteller in residence at a fancy private school on the west side for some real money. And that East LA school raises money through grants. And that homeless shelter in Hollywood raises money for me. And I'm making a living. And I'm actually really writing. And now my books are actually getting published. After years of being rejected, four get published. And I'm a member of this community accidentally, and I love it. And it feels authentic. And it feels like only I can do what I'm doing in these moments. And you know what? That is attractive to women. <laughs> a lot of women. <laughs> including an incredibly special woman that I met on one of my tours to Chicago who said I will never have a long distance relationship and for sure never move to Los Angeles. <laughs> but she leaps and comes to Los Angeles to my little house in the hills of Silver Lake and we get married and we have two kids. And six years later, we're still there. And I think I went all in and I lost, but was it worth it? Hell yeah, bitches. <laughs> I'm on public TV. <laughs> Antonio's story makes me think about the first time someone said to me, Dudley, are you a human being or a human doing? People who are very driven, we have this tendency where we're either full speed ahead or we're just like a big puddle of nothing. We can't get anything done. There's nothing in between. But when Antonio hit this wall in LA, his life didn't stop. I mean, maybe it felt like it did, but what did it really do? It started to spread out kind of sort of started to take on the shape of the landscape of the real Los Angeles. What if home is not what you imagined it was going to be, but something very different? You think you know what you want, but it may not be what you need. But not everybody comes to LA knowing what they want their life to be in LA. Just a few hills over from Antonio is where Mara Clerken lives. She's Irish and an Irish dancer to boot. Why does she live in a dusty Silver Lake neighborhood of Latino families and hipsters rather than in the verdant land that created the art form that started her off? I'm the kind of person who doesn't like to do just one thing. Maybe it's because I grew up with a mixed culture, an Irish family in London. And I'm a professional Irish dancer, which if you don't know what that is, let me give you a quick blast. I find Irish dancing really limiting. It's traditional, uh, but that's got its restrictions. So I made sense of it by combining it with theatre and comedy. And in fact, my sister and I formed a dance theatre company called the Hairy Marys. And we toured it. We toured it all over the UK and Ireland. Financially, though, we were a disaster. And um, the poverty wore me down, quite honestly. And after years of grind, I put the career on hold and I did a grown-up thing. I went for a real job, a profession. I would train to be a broadcast journalist. Then just as I was graduating, I got offered a job on a radio station in the West Midlands in a town called Walsall, which to put that into Californian terms would be like moving to Bakersfield. <laughs> or worse. Not the BBC position I had in mind at all. <laughs> oh, God, would I really leave London for nowheresville? What was my life coming to? And in that blank bit, that chasm where I didn't know which way to jump or what to do, there appeared this guy, an American in London, a guy I'll call Chris, I wasn't actually that keen at first. Yes, he was a pretty boy in a Keanu Reeves sort of way, but not really my type. Most of my previous boyfriends had been lovable rogues, bad boys, alcoholics, <laughs> drug addicts, ex-cons, womanizers, musicians. 
yeah, psychoanalyze me all you like, but they were good looking and they started out as great fun. By comparison, Chris was maybe a little bit dull, but then again, he didn't cheat on me. He wasn't drunk all the time, he had a job. This was new territory for me. <laughs> I found myself liking him more and more. Friends and family, they were delighted. At last, Maura has found herself a decent bloke. But as the summer drew to a close, Chris got a job offer back in LA, one that he really couldn't refuse. We discussed a long distance affair, and I imagined myself pining for him from solitary confinement in Warsaw. <laughs> So I put it to him. What if I come to California too? He was ecstatic. I needed to break out of my old life. Instead of stagnating and, and being haunted by past failures, love would solve everything. Now, logistically, I couldn't go straight away. I had to apply for a visa, apply for jobs. So I visited Chris over the following year, four times in his Hollywood Hills home. And, well, I remember the view from the plane the first time I flew into LAX. About an hour before landing, all I could see was desert. And then standing at the airport, my eyes had to adjust to the brilliant light. It was unreal. And weather like this is so rare where I come from, I couldn't help smiling. It was the perfect backdrop for the perfect romance. But the glow of love was flickering. The pressure for each trip to be a love epic made us both tense. We started arguing, shouting at each other. It was horrendous. On one occasion, I burst into tears and tried to call the whole thing off. He hugged me tight. Don't worry, everything would be fine. He was so caring and so reassuring. About a month before my final flight to Los Angeles, I was ready. I'd packed up my life, rented out my flat, held a big farewell party for all my friends. I'd even spent my life savings, about $8,000, on a US visa. Chris phoned me at my parents' house where I was staying. Hi, Chris. I think you should think about asking your lawyer not to cash the check. I, what do you mean? I've, I've already paid him. What, was Chris offering to pay him instead? Uh, or was he thinking of coming back to London so I wouldn't need to emigrate for us to be together? What was I not understanding? I don't think it's going to work out. Yeah, I know my timing sucks. <laughs> How would a normal sane person react? Take the job in Walsall. <laughs> Hit the pub. Beg him to reconsider? No, no, don't worry, I didn't do that. So shall I tell you what I did do? I decided I would move to LA anyway. Yes, I gave up the security of everyone I held dear. I left my beloved home city to move 5,000 miles to not join my boyfriend, not live with him, not be with him ever again. No, he dumped me and I came here anyway. <laughs> Barking mad. <laughs> I wasn't sleeping or eating, but I was frantically emailing every friend I met on my previous trips here, asking them for help with places to stay or any possible work that they knew about for when I got to LA. It was a combination of too late to back out now and we'll get back together again denial of the facts. I would find work, make money and succeed and help him come to his senses. Stubborn, bloody minded, nothing would stop me. Wildfires were burning when I got to LA. And instead of Chris's home in the Hollywood Hills, I found myself sleeping on a friend's couch in a gritty Long Beach neighborhood while ashes fell apocalyptically from the sky. <laughs> Surprisingly, what I actually felt was alive. Walking along the sands at Long Beach every morning, gazing into the Pacific Ocean, I experienced extreme feelings of exhilaration and utter despair. Sobs of agony would turn into high-pitched, joyous singing and back again. My madness drove me. I extended myself, obsessively updating and sending out my resume to every organization, website, directory I could find on education, theater, dance, dance education, dance theater, Irish in LA, Irish dance, Irish theater, Irish education, to make myself known, available, employable. 
Had I been half as industrious in England, I could have been running BBC Radio London by now. <laughs> After I'd been in LA about a, a month, my mad plan began to work. Chris phoned. He wanted to meet for coffee, but I said I was busy. I forced myself to wait for a week before calling him back. He suggested dinner at El Cholo on Western. I dressed to kill. But don't worry, I didn't bring a knife. <laughs> we spent the first hour flirting and chatting excitedly about my impressions of LA and potential jobs. He behaved as if we were on a hot date. After a margarita or two, the evening took a turn. It was late. The staff were waiting to close up. We were the last ones there. My rage started bubbling to the surface. I accused him of cowardly deceit. Why hadn't he acted sooner? How dare he lead me on only to drop me when it was too late to back out? He was shocked and tried to extricate himself from the situation by standing up to leave. The Mexican waiters glared at him. <laughs> he sat back down. They brought me another margarita. <laughs> He would like for us still to be friends. Not a chance. That was the last time we met. My outburst wrecked any chance of a reconciliation, of course. But strangely, I didn't regret it. Earning a living was a great distraction from heartache. The Irish dancing community, long established in Southern California, invited me to judge at festivals in Westchester, Thousand Oaks, and Glendale. I performed in concerts at UCLA, at the Celtic Arts Center in North Hollywood. And you know what? That dance theater career that I'd left behind in London and had almost given up on, it was quietly coming back to life in LA. LA, it's a positive place. The British are famous for their class system, for looking down on you putting you in your place. And coming from an Irish background, the effect is reinforced because the Irish are world champions at begrudgery. Stop showing off. Who do you think you are? Any bright or wacky idea I ever had, it's been done. Here, you say, yes, go for it. In LA, I felt free to think outside the box to invent new education programs, write original work for theater, and come up with some weird and yes, wonderful creations in this land of freedom and encouragement. I'm still not sure if this is the place for me though. I'm not sure where home is. Settled, that's a scary word. Was I ever settled in London? Maybe I'm not settled in my own skin, or maybe. A city as unsettled as Los Angeles is where I belong. Looking back, I wonder if Chris was a temporary but necessary insanity. Intuitively, I knew that there was a big new world waiting out there for me, but I had to trick myself to change my life. And this, this being transplanted in LA, doesn't feel like the end, only a continuing beginning. People say to me, how can you live there with all that pollution and traffic? It's just like London, I tell them. <laughs> but with sunshine. <laughs>
uh, that's the home we need. We can't let ourselves get confused by what other people tell us home is supposed to be. As every teenager knows, home can be your safe place or it can be your prison. It can be the place that encourages you or a place that shuts you down. And the truth is, if it's the latter, then all you're really ever going to think about is getting away from home. But if that's the case, does that have to spoil the idea of home for you forever? Are you really destined to be an eternal expatriate? Or is it possible for you to come back and fix that home? And maybe fix that wound in yourself? It was the 1960s, and the Chicano Civil Rights Movement was burgeoning. But in Trini's home, the times were not a change in. I grew up in a family, a large family of 11 children, in Pacoima, which is a working class area of LA, out in the Northeast San Fernando Valley. And my mother and father were very traditional Mexican uh, cultural family. And so that was, that was the way I grew up. But for some reason, no matter what I did, it wasn't good enough. And I think, looking back, it had to do with my, my mom in particular being so um, disappointed I wasn't like the rest. And somehow I didn't have this bond with her that, uh, that she had with, with the others, and I felt it. But I just figured if I just try hard enough, then it would change. So I started putting myself aside and tr just trying to always second guess, what do I need to do? How do I do it? How can I please? And I became a pleaser. Well, in 1971, luckily for me, there was a huge, huge uh, movement, a social movement, a political movement for representation, for, for uh, being heard and being seen, and that was the Chicano movement. There was all this activity with Cesar Chavez trying to organize uh, the farm workers in, in the fields. And so I was quite um, happy at that time to, to be learning about this. But I was not active because I wasn't allowed to take part in anything like that. One of the things that happened was that um, not getting the acknowledgement at home, I ended up doing really well in school. But I did so well that by the time I was graduating from high school in 1971, I was asked to go to Stanford. But my mother kept saying no. One of the things that I remember clearly that was said was, why do you need to go to college? All you're going to do is get married and have kids. Nobody asked me if that's what I wanted to do. Finally, the compromise was, we'll let her go to school if she goes to the local school. So there was no Stanford. Then it was 1975, and I was about to graduate. It was almost my last year before, before graduating. But I couldn't handle it anymore at home. Because at home, I was still being treated as if I was in, I don't know, high school, I guess. Um, I had homework to do, but the lights had to be turned out at 10. And so finally one day, I was in my room, and I was looking around, and I, and I realized, you know, I just can't do this anymore. I can't. I can't. I, I'm not growing. Uh, there's, there's, I'm learning so much. I was excited by the, the kind of ideas that were going on at the time, the idea that things could be different, that you could be seen and heard. That's what an idea. And so I, I was sitting there, and I realized I don't want to go on anymore. I really cannot go on anymore. And I considered taking my own life. At that moment, I realized I didn't know what would happen if I took my life. But I also didn't know if I took my life out of there, what would happen to me. I knew I wasn't prepared, but I also didn't want to die. And at that moment, I didn't know that what I was really going through was that I, something had to die in order for me to continue living. And at that moment, I decided, OK, I'm going to leave. And little by little, I started getting my clothes, the few clothes that I had, my books for school, my important papers. I started putting them aside. And I told them the day that Mary was going to come with her mom to meet them so that they could know 
who I was going to live with. So the day that that, that was supposed to happen, Mary showed up in her little truck, and uh, my mom and dad were nowhere to be found. And I had to decide, do I do this without them here, or do I back up and wait? And I was so afraid that if I backed up, that I wouldn't do it at all. So we were driving down the, the driveway, and all of a sudden, my dad shows up. And he's furious. He's furious. And he's looking at me with fire in his eyes, and, and I just thought, oh my goodness, he's going to kill me. But what he said was, really, the, the very thing that, that I was afraid of, and he said, if you leave now, you are never coming back. And I was on that edge, the edge where you're either going to jump or you're not going to jump. And I had to jump. For my life, I had to jump. And so we rolled down the, the, the driveway, and my dad's there just enraged, and I had to leave. And so I'm going down, and I have to, I have to be honest. I was afraid, and at the same time, I was exhilarated. I was, when we were driving down, I remember thinking, yes, I'm free, I'm free. And I was, it was such a mixed feeling because I knew I was leaving my family, but I also knew that I was heading to some place that I needed to go to stay alive. So that was, that was the leaving home. It turned out that for 20 years, my dad would hold on to that declaration that I couldn't come back home. And here I have a whole family and aunts and uncles and cousins and everybody who, as, as a Mexican family, you get together all the time for birthdays, for baptisms, for everything, everything. And I couldn't be there. It was finally in 1983 where I decided I couldn't be in the city of LA with my family and not be able to be part of my family. So I left. I left because I was invited to be on an editorial board in Chicago. I didn't really have a grasp of how much that whole experience of being disowned had, had held on to me because in my mind and in, in my uh, spirit, I felt crushed. I felt so small that I could be somebody's daughter and be thrown away like that. That was difficult. And, and I began to feel that the way to be in the world was to, to function, to, to just do as I had at home, to earn my way, to prove my way, to prove I was valuable, instead of knowing that you're valuable. And so I worked hard. I donated my hours. I did, I did so much, and I, and I meant it. I meant it. it. This was the world that I wanted to be a part of, but I wasn't my full self. I didn't believe in myself. Luckily, I, I met my husband, uh, who had his own set of issues. He had also been thrown out of his house, and we were so different, and yet we were so alike in the things that we still needed to heal from. He ended up writing a book which became very, very well known all across the country. And he, we, we ended up having two children. By the year 2000, we realized that, and by then my mom and my dad had died, it's time to have the, the kids know their aunts and uncles and all their many, many cousins. And we came back in 2000. Well, my husband and my brother-in-law and myself, one day were sitting around and thinking about how Pacoima and the San Fernando Valley had been so neglected that why, why wasn't there cultural centers like, like Chicago? Why wasn't there poetry like in Chicago? Why wasn't there all these music everywhere like in Chicago? And we looked at each other and we realized, well, that's because nobody's done it. So there we were and we had to just admit that if it was gonna be done, we were gonna have to do it. By 2001, December of 2001, we had pulled together our resources and, and started a place called Dia Chuchas. Tia Chucha Centro Cultural and Bookstore. And it was a place to bring the heart of community, which is celebrating culture, to the, the San Fernando Valley. And then they looked around and they said, well, who's gonna run it then? And I said, don't look at me. 
<laughs> well, but that's what happened. And thank goodness that the world <laughs> is what it is because finally that place that we built for everybody else, well, it's made all the difference because now not only do I write, but I can get up in front of a mic. I do do poetry. I do um, share my story. And then I found that it wasn't just me that had been prevented from going to school, that that still happens today. Girls, females are still being told, no, you don't need to go to school. You can do something else. Don't dream big. Don't, don't, you know, occupy your space. Don't. And that's why now I'm determined to, to tell my story and also to hope that this story doesn't get repeated. Okay, so here's the thing about Trini's story for me. The classic immigrant child story is the jazz singer. The story of the Orthodox Jewish you know, kid who doesn't want to be a Jewish cantor, but leave it all behind to be an American jazz singer. That's kind of how Trini's parents seemed to see their story. But the truth is, it was the exact opposite. She didn't want to leave home. What she wanted to do was make home bigger. She wanted to expand it so it could include you know, new ideas, new possibilities, a whole new world. But they could not see it that way. And I began to think, you know, maybe it's something about the fact that LA is so so large that it can fool people into thinking that if you just stay in your neighborhood, you can keep the changing world out there outside. You can keep your, your traditional culture intact. But the truth is, the vastness of LA is actually an illusion. The world always makes its way in. And if you were Trini's parents, that was maybe felt as a curse. But if you were a child like Trini, or the other people now living in that community, that's actually LA's special blessing. No matter how far apart, how spread out everyone in Los Angeles is, ultimately, all of those different worlds become part of our world. So far, we've had one story of returning to LA and two stories of following love to LA. But for earlier generations, this move to LA was not such an easy thing. If you've read like any Walter Mosley novels, anyone out there? Mm -hmm. Okay, you know that LA in the 1950s was hardly a bastion of racial equality. But compared to rural Maryland, where Barbara Clark grew up, the difference was, you know, if not night and day, it was night and morning. And it all came down to her making a practical decision where a more ordinary woman would have demanded romance. I sat next to Ray's hospital bed, holding his hand as he slept. I glanced around the master bedroom that I had shared with him for so many years. But now, I occupy the guest room, and his current roommate was a live-in caregiver. Sunlight streamed in through the window shears as if to brighten the room. His wheelchair stood in the corner next to the walker that he no longer used. The desk, instead of papers and pens, held spray-on body wash, creams, lotions, and a blood pressure cuff. The dresser, instead of combs, brushes, and cosmetics, held pill boxes, medicine bottles, and stacks of freshly laundered towels and washcloths. It wasn't supposed to be like this. I smiled a little as I remembered his proposal. We, we were having lunch in the cafeteria at Howard University in Washington, DC. January, 1955 and it was really cold outside. He said, how would you like to live in California someday? And then explained that it was always warm in California. He admitted that he'd fallen in love with Los Angeles while stationed at Norton Air Force Base in San Bernardino. The beautiful wide beaches, the snow-capped mountains, 
people from all over the world, and no segregation like that in his home state of Florida. He finished by saying, so as soon as I graduate, I'm going to move to Los Angeles. Well, I think it's great you already know what you want to do, I said. Takes some people years to figure that out. Then after a pause, he added, so um, marry me and come to Los Angeles with me and we'll plan our lives together. <laughs> marry him? <laughs> marry him? Well, I, I dated him off and on for about a year and a half, but not exclusively. And well, there certainly had been no commitment. Marry him. Before I could respond, he went on saying, look at it this way. Now with our degrees, we can both get good paying jobs. And with combined incomes, we can accomplish a lot more together than either one of us could alone. We'll make a great team. Well, I was speechless. Here he was, seriously proposing marriage and well, he never even said he loved me. Marry him? Well, I didn't give him any kind of answer. And so he let it drop. But later that evening, after I got home, I thought about what he was suggesting. I realized that even with my degree, I would be limited in how much I could accomplish on my own. And I knew I didn't want to spend the rest of my life living in that small, segregated community I grew up in, in the Maryland suburbs of Washington, DC. Two nights later, he called. Uh, so uh, what do you think about living in California? Well, I, I must admit, it makes sense the way you put it. Then you'll go? Uh, yes. And uh, you, you'll marry me? Yes. He dropped the telephone. <laughs> Six weeks later, we left the campus one afternoon and we were married in my church rectory. No big wedding, no reception no honeymoon. And it just happened to be February 14th, Valentine's Day. <laughs> that had not been planned. Sure enough, a year later, we moved to Los Angeles. He drove the car out with his brother to get the car here. Four months later, I flew out with his brother's wife to join them in the apartment they had already rented and furnished. Now, I loved Los Angeles at once. And he cemented that feeling by showing it off to me. Santa Monica Beach, Griffith Park Observatory, the LA Zoo. Why, we even had dinner at Perino's, the Brown Derby, and the Coconut Grove. <laughs> Now, such places on the East Coast would not have welcomed us. He wanted me to see that the move to Los Angeles had not been a mistake. He was working as an aeronautical engineer with North American Aviation, and I soon got a job with the Los Angeles Public Library. So at the end of our one-year lease on the apartment, we had enough savings along with his GI Bill to purchase our first home in Compton, California. A year later, our daughter was born and we installed a swimming pool in the backyard. And one day as I looked out and watched as he was teaching our daughter to swim, I thought, wow, we've got it all good paying jobs, two cars in the garage, a lovely home, a beautiful daughter, 
and a California swimming pool. <laughs> now, who could ask for more than that? And it had just happened in three years. He had been right. We made a great team. Still, he never said, I love you. But he did come in from work one day and say, I quit my job today. <laughs> or rather, I was fired. What? What are you talking about? Well, he explained that early on, he had registered and been accepted at Southwestern School of Law. And on that day, he had gone in and filled out the necessary papers. He continued by saying, uh, you see, uh, they're laying off engineers at the company. And although my name wasn't on the layoff list, I asked Bob to add it. That way, I can collect unemployment while I'm going to school. So when were you going to tell me your plans? Well, I just did. <laughs> He laughed, then more seriously added, well, I didn't want you to worry in case things didn't work out the way I had hoped. Besides, I wanted it to be a surprise. <laughs> well, it was a surprise, all right. But he finished law school in just three years, passed the bar on his first try, and immediately set up a criminal defense practice on Crenshaw Boulevard. The following year, we purchased our dream home in Windsor Hills. Now, in the years that followed, his law practice really took off. He handled some really high-profile cases, including the Richard Ramirez Night Stalker case, which brought him media attention from all over, locally and nationally. He became a celebrity. And in the years that followed, we settled in, and one day I watched as he was teaching our daughter how to analyze a legal brief. For now, he was shepherding her through law school at USC. And once again, I thought, wow, we've got it all. He had been right. We made a great team. Yet, he never said, I love you. But by then, huh, I knew he did. <laughs> so there I sat, next to his hospital bed, holding his hand. His face was pale and drawn against the blue pillowcase. The Parkinson's disease had so decimated his muscle tone that he barely made an impression under the thin blanket that covered him. Slowly, he opened his eyes and looked up at me. A slight smile flitted across his face as he said in a quiet voice, I love you. I couldn't speak. I could only squeeze his hand as my tears dripped down onto our conjoined hands. It had been 59 years since that Howard University proposal, and he had been right all along. For to the very end, we were a great team. We all want a love at first sight story. You know, I mean, well, what a time saver, right? You know? <laughs> but the, the reality is that you can't see everything about a person in one moment. It's impossible. It takes years of, of days of rowing together and going through things and, and depending on each other and testing each other before you can really know who a person fully is. I mean, it, when you do all that, it almost makes you know, the idea of love at first sight you know, seem like kid stuff. I mean, after four or five decades together, who wouldn't really rather have been on Barbara's team? Here's what I think. Think, think of, of a city like a spouse, Los Angeles. 
how can you know what you feel about it when it's impossible to see all of it in one moment? You can't have love at first sight for Los Angeles because, you know, which part of it? Are you in the hill, the Windsor Hills, the hills of Silver Lake? Are you in Santa Monica? Are you in downtown LA? Are you in Silmar, where it's up against the Angeles National Forest? I mean, it's just, it's, it's ridiculous. It's impossible to take it all in, to even know how you feel about it. And really, even then, after you've seen it all, you have to then find out how it's going to play with you, how it's going to treat you. For Barbara in the 1950s, rural Maryland was not going to let her on the team, but L.A. would. For me, a dozen years ago, New York stopped being my good teammate, but Los Angeles kept showing up, kept delivering what I needed, and eventually it kind of got through my thick head. And it didn't happen for an instant for Mara or Trini or Antonio. You know, and maybe it shouldn't. Maybe it's supposed to take time. And maybe we're supposed to participate in that process too. So if you're watching this and you're not sure yet if Los Angeles is your home, try this. Go out and really take part in every part of Los Angeles. And then tell me how you feel. And this has been Telling LA.